So about four years ago now, um, my family decided that we were going to move into a bigger house. Our family was growing, and so we went through the process of moving. And I don't know about you, but uh, I really don't like moving. You got to pack everything up. You got to load it all in a U-Haul. You got to haul it wherever it is you're hauling it. But then, not only that, you got to put it all in your house. You got to unpack it, and you got to place it. And my wife Melody and I, neither one of us really kind of have an eye for putting old stuff in new places. So we really don't know how to arrange our house to kind of make our house feel and look like a home. But thankfully, we have a friend who's really good at this. She's awesome. She stages homes for sale. And so she came over and she offered a little bit of help. She started hanging pictures and rearranging furniture and our new home began to look really, really good. And somewhere along the process where she was setting everything up, she comes up to me and she says, you know, Zach, um, what you need, I think, is just a little bit of foliage, like a plant, something green. It'll kind of warm the room up. It'll make it feel a lot better when people come into your home. And so do you have anything like that? Do you have any foliage? And I thought to myself, and all of a sudden I realized that we did have some foliage that we kept just in case. It's in a box. It sits in storage. It has lights on it, and we bring it out once a year in the month of December. But besides that, quite frankly, I didn't have any foliage. I didn't have any plants. I didn't have anything green because not only do I not have a green thumb, I have a black thumb. I killed a cactus once upon a time. Nothing lives when I get a hold of it. Now, here's the thing. I agree with her. I mean, it's awesome. Foliage, plants, it does make things look wonderful. I just don't know what to do with those things. You know, right now at Concordia, we're in the series. It's on the Old Testament book of Exodus. We kicked it off last weekend, and I'm excited about this book because this book is kind of an action-packed book. It's pretty much the ancient version of an action movie. You could stick The Rock, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Chuck Norris, any of those guys, Bruce Willis, right into the middle of it, and they would feel right at home. Because in the book of Exodus, you get pillars of fire that float in the sky. You get seas that part and staffs that turn into snakes and rivers that turn into blood. It's a lot of fun. It has a lot of action. And yet, if you read the book of Exodus and all you ever do is look at the action, you're actually missing the main message of the book. Because there's more to the book of Exodus than just action. The point of the book of Exodus is that all the action is actually supposed to gain some traction in our hearts and in our lives because behind every action in this book is none other than God Almighty himself. And so one of the things we need to understand as we look at this book is we need to begin to understand how God took action on behalf of his people of old. Because this is going to lead to a deeper appreciation for how God still takes action for his people right now, for you and for me. And so this weekend, as we continue our series, we're going to be coming to a story that is probably the most famous story that has to do with foliage in the history of the whole world. It's about a man named Moses and an encounter that he has with a burning bush. Now, before we get there, let me just give you a little bit of background. Last weekend, uh, when we kicked off this series, we began with the birth of Moses, one of the main characters of the book of Exodus. And Moses, when he's born, uh, he's really not born into a good situation and scenario. Uh, he is born when his people, the Hebrew people, are being oppressed by the Egyptian people. And not only are they being oppressed, they're being enslaved by the Egyptians. And the Pharaoh of Egypt at this time hates the Hebrew people so much that he actually issues an edict that every single Hebrew boy that is born is to be killed. He wants to get rid of the Hebrews, and so he's going to try to do it by genocide. And so when Moses is born, by all rights, he should be born, and then he should pretty much immediately die but Moses' mother, of course, does not want to kill her precious little baby boy. And so Moses' mother hatches a plan. She gets a basket and she floats him down the Nile River where Moses is discovered by none other than the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt himself. And the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt sees this Hebrew baby boy and she takes pity on this Hebrew baby boy. And she takes this Hebrew baby boy under her wing. She brings him into the palace of Pharaoh and so Moses grows up as part of the Egyptian royal family. This little baby, who by all rights should have been killed as soon as he was born, actually becomes royalty and grows up in the household of Pharaoh. And everything's going along great for Moses until Moses gets a little bit older and he begins to have a few questions about where he came from, about his origin, about his history. And so he decides that he's going to go check out his people, the Hebrew people. And so he goes and he finds them in the slave fields working for Pharaoh. And what he sees there unsettles him and deeply upsets him. 
In Exodus 2 verse 11, it says that he sees an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, one of his own people. And so he looks around and he sees no one, and then he makes a choice. He decides to strike the Egyptian dead. Now, it's at this point that everything in Moses' life changes just like that. Because Moses, this far, has been royalty. But now Moses has committed a crime, and not just any old crime. He's committed a capital crime, the crime of murder. And you know what the penalty for murder is? If you murder somebody, if you kill someone, you get killed yourself. Moses knows that if Pharaoh finds out, he's going to be on the chopping block. And so Moses doesn't want to face the music. So what does Moses do? He goes from being royalty to being a fugitive. He runs away. He takes it on the lamb. And our text for today, Exodus 3, shows us where Moses runs to. And so our text for today, Exodus 3, beginning at verse 1, here's where Moses runs to. Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, which is the mountain of God. Moses, it turns out in Exodus 3, verse 1, flees to a place called Midian. Now, you need to know something about Midian. Uh, Midian was not really a place that most anybody ran to. Midian was normally a place that everybody ran from because, quite frankly, there was nothing in Midian. Midian was not interesting. Midian was not exciting. Midian was desolate. Really, the only thing that there was in Midian was a shrine to a pagan god known as Baal Peor. And Baal Peor was one of the big pagan gods of the ancient world. And uh, Baal Peor, uh, when you worshipped Baal Peor, you didn't worship Baal Peor in a good way. Uh, Most of the worship services of Baal Peor in the ancient world involved, let's just put it this way, they involved a lot of sensual indulgence, a lot of debauchery, a lot of licentiousness, a lot of immorality. There's this great line from uh, Paradise Lost by John Milton, and John Milton actually talks about the worship of Baal Peor in the ancient world, and he writes, when people worship Baal Peor, they would engage in wanton rites, which caused them woe. And so this is where Moses flees to. He he flees to this center of Baal Peor worship. And not only does he flee there, he actually settles down there. And not only does he settle down there, he actually gets married there. He marries into a family, a Midianite family, who is already living there. And he gets himself a new father-in-law. Notice who he is. Exodus 3 verse 1 says that his father-in-law is Jethro. And by the way, what does Jethro do for a living? Exodus 3 verse 1 says that he's a priest of... Midian. And so he's one of the guys that leads people in these pagan worship rites that are licentious festivals. Moses marries into a pagan family. All this means that when Moses flees to Midian, quite frankly, he's not in a good place spiritually. He's in a pagan place. And he's living kind of desperately. Now, not only is Moses not in a good place spiritually, he's also not in a good place vocationally. Exodus 3 verse 1 says that Moses, when he flees to Midian, he becomes a shepherd and he shepherds the flock for his father-in-law. Now, there's this great line at the end of the book of Genesis. Genesis 46 verse 34, it says this, all shepherds are detestable to Egyptians. There's another line. This one's from the Mishnah. The Mishnah is an ancient compendium of Jewish rabbinical teaching. The ancient rabbis would talk about the careers you wanted to go into and the careers you did not want to go into. And so the ancient rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, had this list of careers you did not want to go into. And so this is what the Jewish rabbis said. They said, a man should not teach his son to be a donkey driver. Not a career you want. Hee-haw, okay? Should not teach his son to be a barber, a sailor, a shopkeeper, or what? A shepherd. Here's the idea. In the ancient world, kind of like in our world, there were things that a lot of people wanted to be and there were things that nobody wanted to be. There were careers that were highly lucrative and there were careers that you would take when you just couldn't get anything else. And one of those careers in the ancient world was that of a shepherd. And it kind of makes sense because after all, what else is Moses going to do? He used to live in Pharaoh's palace. He's had to run away. He's committed a capital crime. He's not going to pass any background check in the world to get the job that he wants. And so he just takes the only job he can get. He takes the job of a shepherd. Bottom line is this. When Moses lives in Midian, he feels like his life has no future. He feels like his life is in the pits. 
He feels like his life is a wreck spiritually and vocationally. In fact, it's kind of interesting. The second half of Exodus 3 verse 1, when Moses is shepherding these sheep, he leads the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he comes to a mountain called Horeb. Now, Horeb is a Hebrew word that means wasteland. And really, the location of Moses' person right here at Horeb is kind of an indication of the state of Moses' soul. He feels like his soul, he feels like his life is a wasteland. He really has nothing left to live for. He really has nothing left to hope in. But then, in Exodus 3, verse 2, All of a sudden, things begin to change for Moses. An angel of the Lord, verse 2 says, appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that though the bush was on fire, it was not consumed. Moses, he's shepherding these sheep for his father-in-law, when all of a sudden, off of the distance, he comes around to the backside of Mount Horeb, and he sees a brush fire. And he looks at it for a while, and it's kind of a strange-looking brush fire to him. Now, you need to understand that in the ancient world, seeing a brush fire, that wasn't like a big deal. Uh, The region of Midian, where Moses is, it gets an inch and a half of rain per year. Think about that. In San Antonio, we can get an inch and a half of rain per hour sometimes. In Midian, you would get an inch and a half of rain per year. A very desert region, very arid region, very dry region. To see a brush fire was not an unusual sight. Maybe you've seen a brush fire before. I have. Sometimes I'm driving along the road when all of a sudden in the horizon I see all the smoke that's kind of wafting up from the ground and I know what it is. It's a brush fire. I drive through it. It's smoky. The smoke gets in my truck. Not really a pleasant experience. You know how many times I've stopped to actually look at a brush fire just to check it out? None. But Moses in Exodus 3 verse 2 does. He not only looks at this brush fire, he lingers on this brush fire, and he notices something curious about this brush fire. Even though there is this bush that is burning, this bush does not burn up, and it does not burn out. It just keeps burning and burning and burning. And finally, Moses gets so curious that he thinks to himself in Exodus 3, verse 3, i got to go over there and look at this remarkable sight. Why is this bush burning but not burning up? When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called out to Moses from the bush. Moses, Moses, God said. To which Moses answered, here I am. Moses sees this curious sight, this bush that is burning, but it doesn't burn up. So Moses goes to check it out. And when Moses finally gets to the bush, he realizes this is not just any old bush. This is not just any old brush fire because the brush fire begins to speak to Moses. Moses, Moses, the brush fire says. And it's at this point that Moses realizes that he's talking to someone much bigger than a brush fire. He's talking to God himself. And when God calls out to Moses, and when Moses answers, here I am, God says to Moses, Exodus 3, verse 5, do not come closer. Remove the sandals from your feet. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. You know, um, this is probably one of my most favorite lines in all the Bible. I like the way the old King James Version puts it. When God speaks to Moses, God says, put off thy shoes for the place where you're standing is holy ground. It reminds me when I was a little kid, I used to go over to my grandma's house and whenever I'd go over there, we'd always have a good time. She'd always spoil me, feed me lots of sugar, send me back home to my parents. But when I first came in, uh, she would always say, hey, Zach, why don't you kick off your shoes and stay a while? That's the way she'd always greet me. And really, that's kind of the greeting that God has given to Moses. When he says to Moses, put off thy shoes. God is saying to Moses, hey, I want to have a conversation with you. I want to get to know you. I want you to get to know me so that you can have a relationship with me. And so so why don't you kick off your shoes and stay a while? This is an amazing invitation that God gives to Moses. And here's what I want to do in the balance of time that we have remaining in this message. Just very simply, I want to talk about what exactly it is that God is inviting Moses to. 
Because God is inviting Moses to some things that are really profound, and I just want to spend a little bit of time teasing these out so we understand just how profound this encounter really is. And so three things that God is inviting Moses to when he says to Moses, put off thy shoes. First thing that God is inviting Moses to, he's inviting Moses to receive a pardon from his past. When God says to Moses, put off thy shoes, he's inviting Moses to receive a pardon from his past. Here's the best way that I know how to explain this. Um, A couple of weeks ago, my little uh, son, Hayden, he turned two. Brought a picture of him here for you. There he is, cute little guy. And so at this age, when your kids hit a milestone moment in their lives, you always throw them a little birthday party. And so Melody and I throw Hayden a little birthday party. We have some folks over, but before folks come over, we always have to clean the house because that's the way that it goes. And so Melody goes into the kitchen and she starts working in there. I go into the living room. I start working in there. And uh, a couple of years ago, we got some new wood floors in our downstairs and they're really, really nice. Here's the reason they're really, really nice. Uh, the carpet that we used to have down there traps a bunch of gunk and grime, and the wood floors do not. I also really do not like the wood floors, and here's the reason why. Uh, the carpet that we used to have down there trapped a bunch of gunk and grime, and the wood floors do not. So you see everything. And with two little kids and a dog, the floors are always a mess. And uh, so I pull out the broom, and I pull out the mop, and I pull out the pine saw, and I'm getting ready to get to work. And uh, my my two kids come up to me, and they say, Daddy, while you're cleaning, can we go out in the backyard and play? And I say, yes, please do. This will make this much easier. And so they go out back, and they play, and everything's going along great for me. I pull out the broom and the mop, and I get to work until about three minutes later when all of a sudden in the back door come my two little kids. And they are covered in grass, and they are covered in dust, and they are covered in dirt. And they say, Daddy, we want to come in. And I say, no, 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 no. What do you think you're doing? You guys are a mess, and I don't want you to bring that mess from outside. Inside, you get back outside. And so they go back outside, and they play for about three more minutes. And all of a sudden, the back door opens again, and in they come again. And they say, Daddy, it's hot outside. We want to be inside. We want to play with you while you are cleaning the floors. To which I say, no, 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 because now they're covered in even more grass and even more dust and even more dirt. And I'm trying to clean these floors. And so I say to them, no, you cannot come in here and play. Listen, I don't care where you play. You can play out back on the patio. You can play out back in the yard. You can go upstairs and play in the loft. The carpet is gross and grimy up there. I don't care where you play, but you can't play here. On any other surface on our property, you may freely play, but on this surface, the surface of the wooden floor that I am cleaning so that it is sparkly and shiny, you shall not play, for on the day you play thereupon, you will surely die. (laughs) Happy birthday, Hayden. It's the forbidden floor. So, So here's the thing. We finally reach a compromise consensus, okay? I say to my kids, okay, um, you can come in and you can play. But first, you got a bunch of stuff on your shoes. So first, before you come tracking in all of that on daddy's holy ground, his nice clean wood floor, first, I say to my kids, take off your shoes. You know, Moses' shoes, when you think about it, they've been a lot of places. They've been in the palace of an oppressor. That's where Moses grew up, in the household of Egypt. They've been at the site and at the scene of a murder. When Moses kills an Egyptian taskmaster. They've been on the feet of a fugitive when Moses runs away because he didn't want to take responsibility for his actions. They've lived now for a long time in a pagan place called Midian. Moses' shoes have been a lot of places. And a lot of those places are dark and broken and depraved and sinful. And so when Moses is wandering around and all of a sudden he kind of stumbles on this holy ground, God says to Moses, okay, all that stuff that you've done, all that sin that you've committed, that needs to be left in the past because I got something new for you, Moses. I got something better for you, Moses. Put off thy shoes. Be released from your past for the place where you're standing is holy ground. 
That's the first thing that God invites Moses to. Second thing that God invites Moses to when he invites him to put off thy shoes. He invites Moses to gain a new perspective on his present. He invites Moses to gain a new perspective on his present. Here, here's the idea. Moses, when he's walking around, he thinks his whole life is a wasteland, right? He's in Horeb. And you know what Horeb is? Horrible. It's not a place that anybody wants to be. And yet, as he's wandering around Horeb, all of a sudden, he sees this burning bush that tells him the ground that he is on is not horrible. It is actually holy. Now, what's that all about? You know, I mentioned at the beginning of the service that uh, Pastor Tucker is with 14 Concordians. They're doing some work in Bethel, Alaska. Let me remind you again, the high there is 63 degrees. But uh, Pastor wanted to kind of show you a little bit of the work that they've been doing, some of the places they've been visiting. So uh, take a look up here on the screens. I'm in Bethel, Alaska, and we've been on this mission trip now for several days. Thank you so much for your prayers. But I thought it would be interesting to show you a few things. So, for example, the plaque that you just saw is part of this church. And this church is more than just the first Christian church. It's a Moravian Christian church here in Bethel, Alaska. It is the beginning of the community of Bethel. What's interesting is if you saw on the plaque, Bethel was established, this congregation with missionaries in 1884. And the daily text in their daily Bible reading was from Genesis 35. It said, go up to Bethel and dwell there. And so they established this community and around this Moravian Christian missionary, a whole society, a whole community rose up. And so this is a very special place. In fact, in some respects, you might call this holy ground. So this is the Moravian Church here in Bethel, Alaska. It's on the grounds of the Alaska Bible Seminary. And what's interesting about this congregation is that it began with the building that we showed you earlier in 1884. Started with that, a tiny single missionary and his wife. They came and it's grown and grown. It's still a relatively small congregation, but there's another fascinating thing. This church has been moved three times. The native people told them that they should build it on the opposite side of the river because of the erosion that happens here. Interestingly enough, they didn't pay any attention. And so this church is the third site. It's been moved three times because the river has literally eroded the ground that the church was built on. So it makes me wonder, was the first site holy ground or the second site holy ground or is this holy ground? So this is the, the campus that we're on. It's the Alaska Bible Seminary and the Moravian Church is here. It's the, the place, the site of the building that was the first missionary outpost. And so it's kind of fascinating to think about this place as they're training indigenous pastors, men from the communities and from the villages to love and care for their people, to be a shepherd for the flock of their individual village. They come here for seminary training. And so you have to ask yourself, the place where all of these pastors are being trained and prepared to minister to all of these people in the name of Jesus, is this holy ground? Pretty cool stuff, huh? Now here's the thing, the question that he asks is actually a really important question to answer. Where is holy ground? Is holy ground at a church? Is holy ground at a mission outpost? Is holy ground at some sort of big tent revival? Is holy ground at a seminary where they train all sorts of people to be leaders in the church? Where is holy ground? Exodus 3 actually gives us the answer. Moses thinks he's wandering around Horeb. He thinks he's in a place that is horrible, but then a bush shows up and says, no, it's not horrible. This is holy. This is holy ground. Because holy ground is really not so much about a place. Holy ground is really about a person. Holy ground is really not so much about a locality. Holy ground is about a deity. And wherever that deity is, there is holy ground. Holy 
holy ground is anywhere that God is. And because God is everywhere, holy ground can be anywhere. Which means that you, my brothers and sisters, tread upon holy ground. I love this old line from this 19th century English poet, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. One of my favorite lines about this story. She says, earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush is a fire with God. Just open up your eyes to see and you'll get a brand new perspective on all of life. Anywhere that God is, that place is holy ground, which means that you stand on holy ground. Moses thought he stood at Horeb. But the place where he stood was actually holy. It's a whole new perspective. That's the second thing that God is inviting Moses to. Third thing that God is inviting Moses to when he says to Moses, put off thy shoes. He's inviting Moses to believe a promise for his future. God is inviting Moses to believe a promise for his future. Remember, Moses thinks that his life is at a dead end. He has no hope. He has no future. He has no path forward. This point in his life is really the last point in his life. But then all of a sudden, off of the distance, Moses sees this burning bush. And when he goes to this burning bush, this burning bush begins to speak to him. And this burning bush begins to say to him, you think your life is over? I'm here to tell you that your life has only just begun. Because I got a mission and a co-mission for you. God says to Moses, Exodus 3, verse 7, I've observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings, and so I want you to go. You go to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God says to Moses, I want you to go back. Go back to where you came from. Go back to Pharaoh's palace. And I want you to carry to Pharaoh a message from me. I want you to tell him, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. You think you're never going to get out of Midian? You're going back to where you came from. You think you're never going to get any place better? I got a place better for you. It's called the promised land. You think you're stuck in the vocation of a shepherd? I got a brand new vocation for you. It's the vocation of liberator. You're going to liberate a whole nation of people. Your life is fixing to enter a new chapter. A new day is fixing to dawn. And it all begins with these words. Put off thy shoes. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. You like shoes? You got a favorite pair? Anybody? I brought some of mine here this morning. These are uh, dress shoes. They don't look great because they need to be shined, but that's okay. Favorite pair of shoes, maybe a pair of dress shoes? You know, you always like to put your best foot forward. Make sure you dress in a suit or a dress or whatever. You always want to look very presentable at your job, with your friends, to anybody who's looking. Of course, on the inside, you feel kind of broken. And sometimes you feel hurried and harried and overwhelmed. You feel like you can barely hold it together. Really, you're just kind of a hypocrite. On the outside, you look great, all dressed up. But on the inside, you feel miserable. Is this your pair of shoes? If so, a burning bush would like to have a word with you. And the burning bush will say to you, put off thy shoes. You don't have to live life in hypocrisy. I got something better for you. For you, I have holy ground. Maybe this is your favorite pair of shoes. I actually love these shoes. These are work boots. And maybe you're a person who works hard. You come in early and you stay late and you keep your nose to the grindstone, work your fingers to the bone. 
You're the boss's favorite. You climb the corporate ladder. You always get the promotion. You always get the raise. And you think that one day you're going to get to the place where you want to be going. You're going to get that office that you really want. You're finally going to arrive. And then you're finally going to be fulfilled. But it's funny because when you get what you thought you needed, you get there and you still feel empty. And honestly, you just feel tired and overwhelmed. You feel like you're going to work yourself into an early grave. Is this your favorite pair of shoes? Because if they are, then a burning bush would like to have a word with you. And the burning bush will say to you, put off thy shoes. You don't got to work yourself into an early grave. Because I have something better for you, for you. I have holy ground. Maybe this is your favorite pair of shoes. I wear these to the beach every year. And you know what? Maybe you like to kick back and relax. Maybe you like to live your whole life on island time, right? Yeah, you may work during the week, but you really live for the weekend. And sometimes, quite frankly, you not only party, you party hard. You party a little bit too hard, and you cross a few lines, and you make a few mistakes, and you commit a few sins. And on Monday, you're left with a few regrets. But it's a funny thing. You're almost trapped in a cycle. You think to yourself, you know what? I got to grow up. I shouldn't do this anymore. And you just go back and do it again and again and again and again. And you feel guilty again and again and again and again. Is is this your favorite pair of shoes? Because if so, a burning bush would like to have a word with you. And the burning bush will say to you, put off thy shoes. You don't got to live your life always skating the edge, always crossing into immorality. I got something better for you. For you, I have holy ground. Maybe this is your favorite pair of shoes. This is actually my favorite pair of shoes. These are Hayden shoes. And uh, maybe you got shoes like these at your house. And you kind of pride yourself in being a parent, a mom, a dad. Or maybe you pride yourself in being a spouse, a husband, a wife. Maybe you pride yourself in kind of having the perfect life, living in the perfect house, being the perfect person, doing all the perfect things, and presenting your perfect family to the perfect world, right? And yet, no matter how hard you try to be perfect, something always seems to blow up. Something always seems to fall apart, and you find yourself not being quite as good as you really want to be, and it overwhelms you. It oppresses you. If this is your pair of shoes, a burning bush would like to have a word with you. The burning bush will say to you, put off thy shoes. You don't got to live your life chasing perfection. Because you got something better than your own perfection. You got God's holiness. For you. You. There is holy ground. The night before Jesus goes to the cross, some of you may remember this, um, he goes to an upstairs room and he shares this meal with his disciples. A lot of times we'll call it the Last Supper. But there's something that happens right before that. Jesus issues to his disciples an invitation. You know what it is? Put off thy shoes. And what Jesus does in John 13, verse 5, is he begins to wash his disciples' feet. The same invitation that a bush gave to Moses, Jesus gave to his disciples. Because the same one who was in that bush with Moses is now dwelling among his disciples. And let me tell you, Jesus knows a thing or two about holy ground. Because the very next day, Jesus is going to go to a place that can only be described as Horeb. It really is horrible. It is a hill. In fact, it's such a terrible hill, such a wretched hill, that the Bible says it looks like a skull. It looks like death. Because that's where people die. That's where people are crucified. And yet, on a mountain that looks and feels like Horeb, 
Jesus goes there to make it holy. Because what Jesus does at that moment is he exchanges all of the sin that we track in on our shoes and instead he gives to us the beauty of his life. And as long as you stand with Jesus, as long as you trust in Jesus, doesn't matter how horrible your life feels. doesn't matter if you feel like you trek through Horeb. You're standing on the holy ground. And so, take an invitation from my grandma. Why don't you kick off your shoes and stay a while? Because when the ground on which you tread upon is holy... Is there really any other place you'd rather be? Think about that. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for the way in which he has made ground that feels horrible and horrible holy. Father, thank you that with him we can have a pardon from our past and we can have a new perspective on our present. We can have a promise for our future, a promise that continues all the way into eternity. And so, Heavenly Father, may we walk with your Son, Jesus. May we trust in your Son, Jesus. May we live for your Son, Jesus. And it is by his name that we pray. Amen. Now as you leave this place, remember, you you tread on holy ground. And because of that, you're blessed. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. And now, go with that holy ground and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out God's precious word of life. Amen.